Today's epistle we hear, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. In today's epistle, Paul is exhorting the Christian converts in Ephesus to arm themselves against the wiles of the devil, against all the fiery darts of the evil one. Their profession as Christians, he's warning them, will not be an easy matter. The evil day, the day of testing and temptation, will come, and they will surely fail if they rely upon their own fragile resources. They are vulnerable to the enemy and can only stand against him when they are clad in the whole armor of God. They must be watchful, be alert, prayerful. But who's the enemy? Paul tells us it's not flesh and blood. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Not flesh and blood, he says. Not ordinary, obvious human difficulties. Not just those weaknesses, but frailties to which our flesh is heir. But something more, something more subtle, more deceptive, and more dangerous. Principalities and powers, the rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. What are these principalities and powers? What are these fiery darts of the devil, this spiritual wickedness which rules the darkness of the present age? These are not flesh and blood enemies. They are spiritual enemies which would destroy our hope, <coughs> excuse me, by the chill winds of cynicism and destroy our love with perversions of desire. Against such enemies, our text is warning us, ordinary defenses will not suffice. We must take to ourselves the armor which only God provides, the armor of the gospel, the armor which is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And that warning that Paul gives is not just to the folk back in ancient Ephesus. It's a warning to us. The temptations which confront us as modern Christians are, above all, spiritual temptations. The temptation to conform to distortions and delusions of the truth of the gospel the temptation to conform and adapt ourselves to this world's standards of right and wrong. In short, temptation to conform ourselves to the spiritual darkness that rules the present age. Against such temptations, we are poorly armed unless we take upon ourselves the armor of God's word prayerfully and watchfully holding fast to that word and helping one another to stand fast against St. Paul, watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Christian faith in life, it's never easy. It wasn't easy in ancient Ephesus and it certainly is not easy now. And, you know, and in, in, in many ways, we're facing a time right now of particularly acute spiritual temptations as individuals, as a nation, and yes, even as a church. The temptation is to conform spiritually to the world around us, often in the name of relevance or keeping up to date. To succumb to that temptation is to distort the gospel and then finally lose faith altogether. 
we can only stand against such lovely seeming temptation by watchfulness and prayerfulness, by being ever more attentive to God's word and ever more obedient to his righteousness. We must be alert. We must be thoughtful about our religion, about our faith, doing as the last Sunday's epistle said, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Today, Paul writes, above all, taking the shield of faith. And then today's gospel lesson follows up on that by telling us something about the power of that shield. I mean, the story from the gospel today, pretty familiar one to most of us, it's an account of one of Jesus' miracles, the restoration to health of the nobleman's dying son. I mean, there have been tons of paper and countless gallons of ink expended upon explanations or sometimes rationalizations of Jesus' miracles in an effort to make them seem more credible. But all that concern about the mechanics of the miracles is uh, honestly completely beside the point and honestly ir irrelevant. Jesus' miracles are not magician tricks designed to puzzle and deceive, you know, us trying to figure out what uh, David Blaine or somebody like that is doing. What they are are symbolic acts. They're symbolic acts that are signs and of the power and wisdom of God in Christ Jesus. Jesus cures the blind and the deaf. Beautiful. And therefore, he fulfills the messianic prophecy. But he also signifies the power of God to open dull minds to the truth which is in Christ Jesus. He feeds the hungry and thereby signifies that he is the true bread, the word of God, to nourish hungry souls. He stills the stormy seas and shows God's power to calm the tumults of our confusions and our despairs. And in today's gospel story, he restores the nobleman's dying son, thereby signifying God's power to raise us up out of our dying state to a new and endless life in the spirit. Jesus heals the nobleman's son in response to the nobleman's faith. And that's a sign for us. A sign that God in Christ has the power to heal the afflictions of our spirits to bring us through temptations if we will only trust his word. Jesus saith unto him, Go thy way, thy son liveth. And the man believed the word that Jesus has spoken unto him and went his way. Oh, that we would do the same. God is faithful. Let us believe his word and trust him. Let us today take really afresh to ourselves the shield of faith and quench the devil's fiery darts. Today, let us take up again to ourselves the whole armor of God that we may be enabled to discern and withstand the principalities and the powers, those perverse and deceitful spiritual principles which govern the darkness of this present age. And when we do so, so we, we then be enabled to serve the Lord, as our colleague today said, with a quiet mind. For encompassed and folded in the whole armor of God, which is the Lord, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we can do nothing but serve the Lord with that quiet mind. Amen. Now unto God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost, do we ascribe as the most justly due great honor, glory, and majesty, both now and unto the ages of ages. Amen. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven.